Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios in New Delhi. I am Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief where we try to take you beyond the headlines on some of the most important uh, global news stories. Today we're talking about a Xi Putin virtual summit. We're talking about the US military budget and finally marking 50 years of the Bangladesh Liberation War. First up, in a move that has wide-ranging impact, the leaders of China and Russia held a virtual meeting uh, in which the agenda, according to Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov, was very broad covering fields such as energy, cooperation in high-tech, and trade and investment. Uh, geopolitics, particularly in light of recent US rhetoric echoed by the G7, will no doubt have featured heavily as well. Uh, Prashant, what are you getting from the summit in terms of what's most newsworthy? Right, so uh, of course, first thing to note is that this is happening, this has been a season of summits, so to speak. Yeah. So a while ago, we saw that Xi Jinping and Joe Biden had a virtual summit. Then Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin had a virtual summit and now Xi and Putin, of course, have had a summit as well. Mm. The, this summit, very different from the previous two summits, though, because they have been, this has been marked by a great deal of bonhomie, a great deal of camaraderie. You know, it's the second time they're meeting these leaders, they've met a lot. And this comes at a time, of course, we'll talk about it a bit later, when there's been, the previous two meetings, for instance, were marked with a particular amount of hostility. Mm. There was a great deal of tension around it and so on. So uh, that was actually one of the most important aspects, the fact that these two leaders met, reinforced the fact that the relationships between their countries are very strong mm. and actually in some senses posited this alliance as an example for the world against some of the other kind of alliances and combinations that are taking place today. Right. So, you know, there was a reference to the fact that uh, there, there was a war, there, there was some kind of a caution against splitting countries into groups. There was, in fact, I think one of the leaders spoke about the fact that using terms like multilateralism and rules, mm. the US has been a great advocate of what it calls a rules-based international order. order right. So terms like multilateralism and rules should not be used to divide countries. You know, and there was an uh, emphasis on really a particular kind of, uh, say, harmony and good relations within countries, which stands out in contrast to what the earlier two summits mm. and some of the other important meetings that have been taking place focus around. For instance, just a couple of days ago, we had a G7 ministerial summit, mm. you know, where the advanced economies, they also brought in the ASEAN countries. And, you know, all these meetings have been sort of uh, focusing on isolating or in some senses cornering Russia and China in various ways. Mm. So in that sense, it is quite significant that this meeting really focused on the sense of mutual cooperation. Mm. And if you look at it, it's interesting, of course, that just uh, weeks after the United States, Australia, the UK all announced the diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics that's going to be held in February 2022. Yeah. Putin made it a point and Biden, uh, Xi Jinping made it a point to note that Putin would be in Beijing for the summit hmm. and they would have they would meet in person after a long time there hmm. so you know that is clearly put you know it is front, put front and center as uh, say something to you know as a contrast to the kind of usage of sports for political gains which yeah. has been condemned by both these countries anyway hmm. or for that matter the fact that both these countries emphasize the covid cooperation that has been taking place hmm. for instance china has become an important site for the manufacture of sputnik vaccines right, right. so all these aspects which you know focused on say, positive cooperation between the countries were really highlighted. Mm. And I think that's really, it's, it serves to send out a message at this point of time, not only to the United States, but also to, I think, other countries which, for various reasons, are allying with the US agenda or are kind of maybe sitting on the fence. Mm. So, you know, the idea is to sort of also give out the message that, you know, it does not have to be, especially to the fence it is, that it does not have to be an antagonistic, antagonistic relationship. relationship. For instance, yeah. recently, we saw that China did have a meeting with a lot of African countries, mm. right, mm. where a lot of emphasis again was placed on trade, on development and stuff. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of, uh, at the same time, there was also very clear warnings that, you know, military adventurism will not be tolerated. Yeah. So I think those are the broad takeaways. Right. Uh, a wonderfully named treaty as well, a treaty of good uh, neighborliness, and uh, positive or friendly cooperation between the two countries. Right. Uh, so, so that is, of course, the positives of these talks that have come out. Uh, but there is still a lot of rhetoric coming from the West. And so what are the broader sort of geopolitical issues that they might have discussed in the context of NATO? and such? Right. So these, there are two angles here. One is, of course, the issue of Ukraine, which you've discussed quite a few times on this show, yeah. which is that the United States and its allies have been making a lot of very loud noises about, loud noises and warnings about Ukraine. You know, some sources even talking about war, yes, for instance, people, even countries like Germany, the new government's ministers have actually have, uh, embraced very aggressive rhetoric against the Russians, mm. despite the close economic ties that bind them. Mm. There have been talks of, for instance, excluding Russia from the SWIFT payment mechanism, mm. which is a really, really dangerous thing, which could destroy the country's economy, cause great hardship to, hardship to people, as many have realized. Mm. So that's happening on one side, of course. The other right. side, of course, is the fact that 
you know, the United States has been using issues like Xinjiang, it's been using issues like Taiwan to sort of mount an offensive uh, diplomatic as well as in other ways offensive on China itself. Mm. And this we know is also part of its long term plan of encircling China for the basic fact that China is emerging as a massive economic competitor to the United yeah. States. So, you know, these issues being used as a pretext. In both these cases, we have seen instances of, you know, the United States conducting war games, military exercises in the regions around Russia and China. In fact, we must remember their neighbors. Yeah. So, these are actually very, you know, problematic aspects because, like we have said time and again, it's not that the Chinese or the Russians have ships uh, in Hawaii or anything of that sort mm -hmm. or near the east coast of yeah. the United States, whereas... The United States military and the Navy especially patrols the entire world. Mm. So we've had instances of the U US underwater submarine colliding with an undersea hill, which we talked about, uh, you know, similarly air exercises with Japan and all that. So yeah. uh, keeping all these in mind this is actually, I think this meeting also sort of re-emphasizing their friendship in the face of some of these threats as well, in the face of some of these aggressive rhetoric as well. Now, it is very unlikely that the West will go to war over Ukraine. I mean, I think the situation will probably be diffused before that. Mm. But nonetheless, the kind of saber rattling that is taking place mm. at a diplomatic level is extremely problematic because you know it sets back the possibility of good ties by a long, long time. Yeah. And we do know that there have been attempts by Russia and Europe to cooperate a bit more closely in the yeah. past, including through the Nord Storm pipeline, yeah. which will supply natural gas. There is a very strong organic link mm. between these areas and even with China for that matter. So, mm. Uh, like again, we've talked multiple times on this show and other shows. The mm. question is really whether, you know, if there is a possibility of a united Eurasian bloc. United not by politics or, or governments, or, of course, yeah. but united by mutual benefit. Mm. Where there are trade ties and there are relationships which make it dif more difficult for conflict to break out. Mm. So whether that kind of a system, that kind of a system, that kind of a structure can come up in the coming years and decades. Mm. Or whether, you know, the old school style of Europe and United States, the Atlantic powers, so yeah. to speak, uh, versus the old school Cold War divides, so to speak, continuing to exist. Mm. So these are two real uh, questions about how the world and, and this axis might really determine the future of the world. So this kind of a united Eurasian uh, bloc, so to speak, which is which has close ties with each other, could have a massive impact in terms of dealing with a lot of crises that are coming up in the future, including mm. climate change, including the issue of dealing with poverty, yeah. including, for that matter, the issue of terrorism itself, which so many of Absolutely. these countries in the West are concerned with. Yeah. All these matters, to, in order to deal with them, it's very essential that there be peace and harmony in uh, Eurasia as a whole. Whereas what the West has been doing continuously is to try to stoke conflict in these regions, we've seen its impact in Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all these places, right? Mm, mm. So, uh, I think that that's a larger, you know, geopolitical battleground, so to speak, and these two competing visions mm. of how the world and the future should be yeah. that are really uh, you know, at battling here. Good One is heads. the yeah. legacy of the Cold War, the mm. legacy of, mm. you know, innumerable wars and battlefields. And the other is the possibility of, say, trade and mutual benefit actually you know, cementing ties and bringing people closer together. Mm. So I think these two visions really are what we need to keep thinking about mm. when we talk, when we think and talk about relations between these two countries as well. Thanks. Thanks so much, Prashant. All right, we're moving on now to a story that is sort of linked, at least very broadly speaking, to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the China-Russia summit. Uh, the United States Senate has passed a 777 billion US dollar defense spending bill, sending the legislation to the desk of US President Joe Biden for final approval. The bill authorizes $25 billion more than the president himself had asked for, and it garnered strong bipartisan support in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. As the world's largest military spender, the US accounts for about 40% of global military spending. We have used our magical studio chair to switch Prashant out for Anish. Uh, Anish, what, uh, sort of, what does this indicate in terms of uh, the mindset of the current political and military leadership in the US coming as it does. We've seen now three successful years of budgetary increases after many years before that where, where actually there were cutbacks. Yeah, I mean, there were cutbacks in a very limited sense if you look at it because there were obviously other ways of uh, compensating for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the real cutbacks we could have said happened during the last uh, administration of the Obama years where you had the military base uh, spending uh, being uh, stabilized at around less than $500 billion. Right. Uh, now we're looking at uh, an enormous increase, actually, because the la because I, if I'm not wrong, the last year's uh, military budget was at uh, about 700 or so billion dollars. 
and that has come to now 777. Mm. Uh, at least last year's included an overseas uh, operations uh, budget that was about close to 69 billion. This year we do not have that, but the military obviously. Uh, and this is more than, as you said, more than what the military even requested, uh, the president requested. Uh, and as you say, like it's, uh, it also shows how difficult it is in the current political establishment to uh, actually bring any kind of meaningful cuts in military spending. Mm. Uh, we have to remember that uh, a large part of the U.S. Uh, political support now also depends on uh, one, the lobbying that the military industrial complex, the defense uh, industry actually spends on uh, each uh, representative and senator in Absolutely. the Congress. Yeah. But apart from that, uh, the other thing we often uh, do not highlight is the fact that there are millions who are dependent on, you know, defense related or defense induced job, as they say. Mm. And that's anywhere between two to three million people. Mm. And so, obviously, a lot of senators, a lot of uh, uh, House representatives are very uh, reluctant to give up on, uh, or actually, or in, uh, in institute measures that would actually bring down mm. military spending in any meaningful way. Mm. You have to remember that bases, for instance, the U.S. military itself has estimated that it is working over capacity when it comes to bases inside the United States. Mm. A, a lot of them are quite obsolete, mm. unnecessary and, you know, money guzzling. But uh, because they uh, give about, you know, anywhere between hundreds to thousands of jobs in any given region, mm. uh, since 2003, the Congress do not allow uh, military to, to close any of the any of these bases. Mm. More than that, as I said, like there is a large lobbying budget, obviously, mm. behind a lot of electoral campaigns. Yeah. And that obviously affects how the political establishment deals with military spending as mm. a whole. Yeah, as a, at policy level, yeah. yeah exactly. Mm. So uh, this uh, reflects in how spending happens. We have to remember that this 777 is just the base budget. Mm. There will be a bigger, larger budget coming up uh, if we include the FBI's budget, budget uh, earmarked for Homeland Security, even the State Department, and uh, and obviously Veterans Affairs and other associated uh, services and departments that, uh, you know, prop up the entire defense department as a whole. Mm. So uh, last year that came to about an additional $228 billion. Okay. And that was that brought it to around close to a trillion dollar uh, spending in you know the last financial year. Mm. So we are looking at a very similar kind of increase uh, uh, being possible this year as well. Mm. So in a way, military becomes like this huge uh, you know, budgetary, exp uh, you know, expense that they somehow cannot do away with. Yeah. But at the same time, it is actually coming also at the cost of other, uh, you know, services. We have to remember that, it's, you know, serv essential services like the CDC, for instance, mm -hmm. which is currently uh, one of the most essential uh, agency when it comes to counter pandemic efforts, yeah. is working at less than a percentage mm -hmm. of uh, the military's budget. budget. So. This is something that really just, ju this is just to give you a, a broad scope of how this mm -hmm. thing works right, right now. Fair enough. So, uh, we were talking some specifics earlier and this is where we link back to our previous story. Uh, you were talking about overseas uh, operational spends and such. There are specific allocations uh, that are, can clearly be seen as relating to China and Russia. Uh, tell us a bit more about those. Yeah, so... We have about two major kind of security initiatives, as they call one is the European Security Initiative, and the other is the Chinese uh, Pacific Security Initiative. Mm -hmm. Both of these are, uh, you know, targeted at Russia and China, respectively, uh, billions of dollars. Uh, the Pacific uh, Security Initiative is around, I think, seven billion dollars, and uh, the same goes to about European Security Initiative, which close comes to around four. Uh, billion dollars. In each of these cases, we are right now looking at uh, an increasing hostility, not only on the part of the United States, but its allies in Europe to 
uh, and the Pacific region to actually counter these uh, two nations, uh, not only diplomatically, as we as Prashant spoke just before me, yeah. but also in other ways that and you know using certain uh, certain you know spark points like uh, be, be it Ukraine or Taiwan uh, to make that as a if not a pro full fledged military confrontation, but a security confrontation in many ways. And that uh, is alarming, the fact that the US Congress, in a very bipartisan way, supported this, also shows we have obviously dissent uh, being yeah, seen in course, the yeah. House of Representatives and the Congress, like 10 senators did not, uh, voted against the bill, obviously. Mm. But at the end of the day, uh, this shows that now what used to be a separate earmark budget for overseas operations mm -hmm. is now part of the entire military's uh, budgetary operations. Exactly. Op right. So, and it just uh, is expanding the scope of how the U.S. military is going to operate mm -hmm. right now. It is not going to be a separate section of, you know, looking at, say, invasions, but a more... Uh, you know, hybrid sort of security yeah. relations with other countries and proxy wars that we cannot really uh, overlook over time, you know? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Anish, for that so much. Right. Last but not least, on 16 December 1971, Lieutenant General Amir Abdullah Khan Niazi, Chief Martial Law Administrator of East Pakistan and Commander of Pakistan Army Forces loca located in East Pakistan, signed the Instrument of Surrender, ending Bangladesh's War of Liberation. Today is 50 years since the end of that horrific period in the region's history. Uh, an interesting subject that's come up during the course of these 50 year celebrations is the US approach. To all hands, don't squeeze Yaya at this time, are the words of a US presidential memo written by Richard Nixon that sums up this approach. It came a month after Pakistani troops launched what was known as Operation Searchlight in then East Pakistan, targeting freedom fighters, the minority communities, uh, teachers, students, activists, brutally. Millions were casualties in this operation. And it also led to a massive refugee crisis. India then intervened in support of the Bangladeshi resistance. And on this day in 1971, Pakistani forces surrendered. The day is marked as Victory Day in Bangladesh. So, Prashant, just sticking with the theme of, of the US attitude towards uh, this conflict and how progressively uh, it remained actually uh, in the same, uh, and something that's not talked about in terms of that Cold War era flashpoint when the 7th Fleet was up in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, what is the wider impact of, of, of sort of the right. 1971 war? Right, so it's actually a very interesting memo you mentioned over there because the reference is to Yahya Khan, who was the leader of Pakistan at that point of time. And uh, it's important to note that uh, of course, what the East, pa what uh, at that point there was two, pa Pakistan had two parts, of course, there was yeah. West Pakistan and East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, East Pakistan se separated by India. And uh, at that, I mean, the continent was divided in 1947, religion was the basis on which, of course, this division took place. Mm. Now, what happened over the decades from 1947 to 1971 was that the identity of the people of Bangladesh, today's Bangladesh, was consistently crushed, whether it be language, whether it be culture. Yeah. And, you know, the identity and culture of West Pakistan was sought to be imposed. Yeah. And there was a massive movement against it. A lot of people were martyred. Mm. One of the very important struggles of the... Uh, 20th century, so to speak. Mm. And during all this time, it's important to note that Pakistan was a very close ally of the United States, the US consistently providing support. Mm. So in 1971, when, you know, this crisis broke out in all its enormity, when, uh, as you said, Operation Search Light, a very brutal operation leading to innumerable deaths, mm. a lot of torture, a lot of atrocities was taking place. The US was very clear that it would continue supporting Pakistan, like I said. And uh, when India intervened finally, partly due to the fact that it wanted, it was you know, a close, a closely associated with the resistance in Bangladesh, partly due to the huge refugee crisis that had taken place because of the Pakistani atrocities. Right. Uh, when India did intervene, the United States and the United Kingdom actually sent naval forces and the attempt was basically that they would at some point inter, uh, you know, mm. attack. Mm. What happened at that point of time was that India sounded on its ally, the USSR, mm. which also sent naval forces. Mm. And the presence of the USSR forces is believed to have what stopped the US from launching an all-out assault at uh, on, on Bangladesh and India at that point of time. Mm. Mm. So it's interesting to note that Bangladesh, which was, you know, which is now uh, an independent country, which has made a lot of strides in its own way, 
you know, has, you know, in Bangladesh too, of course, there's been a constant struggle between right-wing extremism, you know, Muslim uh, yeah. majoritarianism and secular thought as well. Mm. From in, uh, a couple of years later, Mujibur Rahman, the founder of Bangladesh, the leader of the movement himself was killed. Yeah. But nonetheless, uh, you know, this uh, strain of thought in Bangladesh, there's been a consistent attack against it and also a consistent battle to defend it. Mm. But even the possibility of that th strain of thought existing would have been under threat because of, you know, US imperialist maneuvers. Mm. And it's, I think, very important to remember that you know, this almost became a massive global flashpoint because Absolutely. the fact that yeah. the United States and the United Kingdom were about to intervene mm. in favor of their ally against a national liberation movement. Mm. And this, I think, takes us to a variety of national liberation movements across the world, mm. whether it be in Africa, you know, the people of Congo, the mm. people of uh, Ghana, for that matter, people mm. like liberation movements in Latin America, for that matter, liberation movements in Asia, many of whom were targeted by the US and the United Kingdom and their allies just for the fact that they wanted to destroy the uh, structures of imperialism. Mm. So I think, I mean, I think in the coming days we'll be hearing much more from our friends and associates in Bangladesh, our sources in Bangladesh, who'll be talking about what it means mm. for them at this point of time, what are the internal struggles they have. Absolutely. But I think today is also a day to remember the fact that uh, what has not changed is the nature of US uh, imperialism itself yeah. or intervention Absolutely. itself. So you have the same kind of military exercises taking place today, the same kind of threats taking place today that were taking place 50 years ago. All right. Thanks so much, Prashant. And that's all we have on the show today. You've been watching Daily Debrief from Prashant, myself and the entire People's Dispatch team. Uh, you can get more on all of these stories from our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and also follow us for updates on all our social media channels. We'll see you again, same time, same place tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.